Hi, everybody. This is Deanna Kosaraju, founder of Global Tech Women. Welcome to Voices 2.0 2014. I hope you're enjoying the great sessions that we've had so far, and we have another amazing session, Engaging Men in Gender Competence. And uh, I will let Bonita introduce her panel, uh, but there's a few housekeeping tips I'd like to let you know about if this is your first time on Spreecast. Uh, number one, you have to log in to participate in the chat window that's over on the right hand side. Um, the chat area is a great area for networking with other participants and we encourage you to do that. Um, you can meet women from all over the world and, and we've had a great representation of women in many countries so far. So I hope that you will take advantage of that. Um, there is a question box down below. It's a blue box there below us. Uh, you can see there. Uh, that's where we would like you to put your questions. Uh, if you have a question for the panel and then we will display those for the panel to answer. Uh, we also will use this link for a recording. So 30 minutes after the session has completed, uh, you can take the same link and provide it to others or to display the session again and watch the recording. And your feedback is always welcome. This is version 2.0 and we're constantly reiterating and improving on what we're doing here at Global Tech Women. So if you have any advice for us, please feel free to email me at deanna at globaltechwomen.com. You can post on our Facebook, our very active Facebook group, or you can tweet it to us. We'd love to hear your feedback. So lastly, um, we are going to display a uh, presentation to you, a slide presentation. Uh, when that goes up on the window, uh, you need to drag it and drop it into a location on your screen that is suitable for you so that you can follow along, uh, but also view the participants in this session. Uh, so they will be referring to certain slide numbers and it will be up to you to move the slide deck forward and backward so that you can follow them along. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to Benita, and I look forward to a great panel. Thanks, Deanna. It's great to be here. My name is Benita Banducci, and I teach gender and engineering here at Santa Clara University in the graduate program. I uh, often have people say, gender and engineering, what is that? Well, it, it's basically what I call um, a opportunity to build a, a gender competence of understanding and skills to work with gender differences and gender differences as we define as competencies. Now you might wonder again, what, well, why call this competencies? Um, fundamentally what I have found is that there are different lenses that men and women often see the world through what I call the more individualistic lens and also the more relational lens. And uh, I have found that if we are really going to be effective using gender differences, we need to talk about them in terms of competencies. So the, most of the guys are coming from this individualistic lens, well, the exceptions, of course. Um, and so they, but they're looking for how do I work with skills? How do I work with, with uh, how people actually get results. So when we frame the differences in terms of competencies, we have real, uh, real action and real uh, effectiveness in what I call, what I found is the increase in productivity and innovation. So I'm going to be, I want to show a couple of slides about, about um, how we differentiate. Um, if you want to put the block up now, the, the deck up now, um, Deanna, and put it to, um, let's see, slide number, well, what do you know? Um, oh, it's slide number two, of course. What, we're, what we have here in slide number two, if you can all go to slide number two. Can they move themselves? I guess, Deanna, yes, I guess they can. Um, and it's just a differentiation between individualistic and relational. Individualistic is primarily looking through the lens of status and who's up and who's down um, in terms of relationships, whereas relational is more looking at how you build connection. And uh, individualistic, you're often looking at um, how to uh, 
uh, use information in a very compartmentalized uh, and um, segmented way rather than the more relational, which is to share information and be able to make connections with information. Uh, the, the third element to the general lens has to do with time. And often you talk about people that multitask, more relational people will probably do more things than one, one thing at once. Whereas the more individualistic usually is focused and does one thing at a time. And finally, I, uh, I'd like to distinguish between a more systems way of thinking uh, again, prioritized um, kind of logic-based thinking, uh, which is more individualistic. Now, this this sounds a lot of you know seems like a lot of uh, um, sort of academic talk, but what I have here today are four great men and a fifth one coming, I believe, um, to talk about what they learned from gender and engineering and the actual applications of it. Because what I've found is uh, for women, it's really important in terms of being able to talk about their competencies for, uh, for the more individualistic people, mostly men, in their lives to understand them and to really be effective <coughs> with them. Um, and for the men, I've found that they have actually been found that they can be more effective by understanding them. It's actually promoted three times in four years. He said it never would have happened. Uh, it was very unusual in his company if he hadn't had this understanding. So with that, I'd like to start uh, right away and, and get to um, our uh, great men here. Uh, we have Scott Lynn here from, from uh, Oracle and, uh, and Udaya um, and uh, Noe and Faison. Glad you were able to make oh, it, Faison. Thank you. And Motaz will be coming in probably momentarily uh, on screen from, from uh, uh, Saudi Arabia. So, um, Noe, actually, I like to pronounce his real pronunciation of <laughs> his name. I know that generally you, we, it was really a big insight for you to, to understand the, the class role. And uh, would you speak to that and what else you got out of the class? Yes, um, well, I'll speak to the platinum real second, but uh, if everyone could turn to slide 13, this kind of uh, summarizes what I'd be speaking of today, uh, which is kind of acknowledging, understanding, adopting, and adapting to differences. And so uh, I've had what, I've, what has been told, what I've been told is an atypical work experience. Um, I've worked all over, uh, most in particular, I've done 10 years in, uh, in entrepreneurship environments uh, with startups. And um, in these startups, uh, I've interviewed and hired dozens of people. And when you're creating a team uh, where you're trying to foster uh, innovation, you, you really have to uh, acknowledge differences and embrace them. Because if you get people that are all like-minded, all thinking the same, it's very hard to, to get innovative ideas, to get thinking, to go outside the box, to find new, uh, new technologies or new ideas. And so uh, you really have to embrace that. Uh, then once you have your team of diverse people, uh, you have to kind of take a whole new, new, new approach. And this is the, the understand on, the, on slide 13. Um, because normally if you have a, a conflict with someone and uh, you know, their idea is, is completely different from yours, uh, you get defensive. And right away you start talking about, you know, no, my, my idea is better. And you, you know, it becomes a fight. And so it's a win or lose situation. And as soon as you do that, you devalue what the other person is offering. You don't, you're not considering it. And so to really foster and create innovation, you need to be able to take a step back and understand what the people are saying. Because there is value there. It may be different from yours, but, you know, you have to be humble and a little humility and accept that. And to, in order to, to fully uh, allow the, you know, the creative juices to, uh, to, to be fostered. And um, the next thing is, uh, as a uh, professor had said, about the, the platinum rule. So we all know about the golden rule, which is uh, treat others as, as you would like to be treated. But the platinum rule is uh, treat others how they want to be treated. Now this is key, uh, I think, to a lot of success I've had um, professionally. Um, for instance, this one company I worked for is an industrial manufacturing uh, facility. Uh, I was managing uh, 30 uh, males out in the field and then uh, the office environment was all females. And so two completely different cultures that I was interacting with every single day. And um, 
the way that I, I was able to find success there was through uh, my application of the platinum rule. And so out in the field, I would talk to the, to the men, get their ideas, get their input, you know, uh, showed that I valued their, their, uh, their opinions. I would incorporate what they were telling me into my, uh, my solutions or what I was trying to, uh, to uh, apply at the site, at the facility, and it showed them that they were, that they were valued, they were being listened to. And that made a huge difference. And uh, by do, just doing those things, uh, th th there was a huge, uh, 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 there are huge contributors to uh, increasing the production uh, while decreasing overtime and overall costs. Now, if you look in the office environment, which I was also working in, uh, a lot of the, the, the women, they were the gatekeepers to a lot of information that we needed in order to run certain analysis for, you know, different types of projects. And, uh, you know, the way that, that uh, you know, using that platinum rule and, and communicating with them, you know, more than just a request, oh, you know, I need this, I need it now, you know, it was, you know, first is build some rapport. Let's talk. You know, who, you know, let me let me build a relationship with you, and you know, understand who you are, what your hardships are, so we can I can relate. And by doing this, you know, when I would then ask for a uh, for a, you know a request for information, it was more like a favor, not a you know a demand. You know, I need this, I need this now, give it to me. And so you know, they would happily you know let me let me assist you with it. And so that allowed me to get you know get information faster than anyone else. And so. Uh, through the, the platinum rule, both in the field and in the office, uh, I, w I was able to uh, get myself from just a localized asset to a regional asset and uh, given the promotion to oversee uh, several facilities. And uh, it, it's, it's all just key to you know, really understanding how do people want to be talked to and how they want to be dealt with instead of just going the same approach to each person where you, know, you, you have to have that personal connection. You need to empathize with them. You need to show them that you understand. And, um, so yes, yeah, so the platinum rule I think very key. Great, thanks, thanks. Udaya, um, what was it that was most impactful for you, and what results were you able to produce out of understanding gender confidence? Sure. I think uh, to me uh, the first thing is um, realizing that there are differences, and how, um, that there are differences in how men and women think. Uh, uh, that itself is a um, uh, I consider it as a uh, big learning from the class. And once you realize, um, you have to understand what are those differences. Um, when you understand what are the differences, then you, ha you have how to um, uh, adapt uh, to how other people, uh, how to interact with the other gender. Um, and, 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 and I think um, I, I still remember um, uh, my, my uh, lecture from my class actually when you say um, when you say you're looking from a uh, looking looking from a, a specific lens I didn't really and um, I didn't really think what you're talking about when you're talking about the specific lens after going to, through the class I can understand like why some people behave the way they behave particularly women uh, I work with a uh, work with work <coughs> In a team, a, a team uh, in a big company that had like almost 400 people and 20 sub teams, and we had to work with um, a, a wonderful woman uh, from a different team. But she's she's always she always had questions, but at the same time, like uh, she wouldn't really um, she she would make she would ask questions, but at the same time, like she was she would not impose anything on anybody. So I didn't realize. I mean, people, everybody was like thinking that. Why is she asking the why why is she asking questions but not she's taking like the questions? Yeah. So, uh, she's so beautiful. It's very hard. She's one of the best girls in the business. How you doing? Hold so on. Like Welcome. Yeah. We're getting yeah. some we're getting some yeah, sound in here. Um, wow. Motaz, is there, is there some sound in your background? There we go. Okay, I think we're okay. All right, go ahead. Okay, so I mean, after attending this class, I went. I kind of like started why that person is behaving the way she is. Um, it's then like okay, it's very clear to me. She is a relational per person, and she wanted to connect all the dots. She wanted to know um, everything. I mean, she wanted to know what is happening, and she wanted to understand the complete picture. So that was the reason why she is posing a lot of questions, and uh, people thought that why is she asking questions that are not related to her. Uh, 
that kind of like uh, made sense. Okay, she's a relational person and she wanted to know the complete picture. And she was posing questions, but at the same time, like she was not imposing on anybody. So to me, actually, she wanted to avoid conflict. She is a relational person. She wanted to build connections rather than um, avoiding the conflicts. Um, and um, she didn't, I mean, that's the reason why she didn't voice her op opinions aggressively. She was conveying in a polite manner, but she wasn't really opinion to voice aggressively. So after this class, I went and talked to her. And uh, my intuition was correct. That was. Isn't that great? That yeah. is so great. Okay. Yeah. So what was the, what did you what was her response when you went to talk to her? Uh, she was surprised. I mean, uh, she didn't expect that I'll have this conversation. But I, when I asked her, she said yes. That's the reason. And um, uh, she wasn't aggressive because uh, she wanted to. She doesn't want to have any con any conflict. She wanted to avoid conflict. She wanted to con avoid conflict, and she wanted to build connections. She wanted to be nice. People, so she was. That's why she her approach is to suggest, but not really um, uh, impose uh, <coughs> impose anything. Um, and uh, and she she uh, and she, she confirmed the connecting the dots too. Correct. She likes a yeah. lot of information to be able to get the full background. Let's put up. I just want to put up um, number three uh, slide. Uh, yeah, because it 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 accounts for so so many things so um you uh oh that's right diana's not putting it up you can turn to slide three i keep thinking diana's putting it up and uh i'm just interrupting for a moment but y you can see that you know the more individualistic person is more highly focused and more, more relational person um, has a very high context and also um, sees a high context speaks a high context thinks a high context so that's what Udaya is talking about, that, you know, for a lot of individualistic people, it looks like this relational person is scattered and all over the place. And what's the point here? Yeah. Right? Exactly. Okay, thank you. Go ahead. I mean, yeah, people conceived her as a, as um, interruption rather than trying to find out the big picture, understand the full uh -huh. They actually picture. see her as interrupting rather than trying to find the big picture. Yeah. Isn't that something? Yeah. So, and I, I talked to her. Maybe you should set the expectations well, so that like people realize uh, your your intuitions. People are not perceiving how you perceiving you. Uh, your people are not seeing your real intentions. People are perceiving it in a, looking it from a different lens, and that's why you are viewed as this. So, she took that feedback uh, very well, and uh, she said that she would incorporate uh, uh, that in ongoing. That is great. I just I just get so thrilled by the men who take on coaching women, uh, as well as of course the women that take on coaching other women or, or men. But that is really great, and I bet she was really gratified that you uh, took this upon yourself to talk to her about it, wasn't she? Yeah, I was a little bit hesitant to talk to her about it, but I it went really really well. Uh, she was. We had a very pleasant conversation. It was really well. And I think without, um, had I not attended this class, I wouldn't have been able to, uh, still able to figure out like why she was. Yeah. Uh, uh, she, was, she had a lot of questions why she was asking questions or doing things the way she was doing. Great. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. Now I know you have the other example of the international team. Sure. Um, but I want to hear a little bit more from other people and then we'll come back to you. Sure. And Motaz, welcome. Great to see you. Hello. Uh, Sorry, I, I lost the link. <laughs> so it took me a uh, bit to find it. Uh, okay. Thanks to Diana, she sent it to me by email. Right. Do you want to tilt your camera a little bit? Because we, we can only see half your face. Tilt it well, there. Well, here I am. Great. Great. So, um, do you want to tell the audience a little bit about yourself, introduce yourself, and uh, well, I, let me say, first of all, that Motaz is actually uh, licensed to deliver this gender confidence work in Saudi Arabia. He hasn't found the opportunity yet. He's been working on it, right? You can tell us about that. But he was so... Well, you could tell it's tough, right? <laughs> Pardon me? You, you could tell it's tough. Well, 
But see, what, what, I, what I'm impressed with is that you felt that it was really that important and that you wanted, you wanted to bring this to Saudi Arabia, along with cross-cultural understanding from Marion's class. That's correct. So why don't you tell us about it and how it's going? I, I mean, I know that, that you haven't actually contracted an opportunity yet, but tell us about what you, what you see and what, uh, how you have applied what you've learned. Sure. Well, um, hello, everybody. My name is uh, Motaz Hajjaj. Actually, I went to school in, uh, in the U.S. I got my bachelor's in uh, computer engineering in Missouri University of Science and Technology. And my master's in uh, Santa Clara University, and that's how I got to know Bonita. Um, during um, my master's, I got more into this um, Gen, uh, gender uh, intelligence courses and also with uh, with Marianne and the cross-cultural training so I started doing like out-of-class work att attending conferences with Bonita and also with uh, with Marianne since it was something that is uh, really interesting me especially that I'm from the Middle East and we have this uh, multicultural environments and also gender competence especially in Saudi Arabia that um, Recent, it's very recent that women started to get more into the workforce than like before. And uh, with now we have like more women and getting more into the, into the workforce, uh, looking for uh, into their careers, uh, which has brought in a lot of challenges in many companies. And as part of my company, I have a startup called chestag.com, which is a digital marketing agency. Um, as I've told Bonita a couple of days ago, I have actually 80% of my staff are females. So looking at to a digital marketing agency, which also has to do with advertising, you could tell it, need, it has to do a lot with the creativity and solving problems. So if we have the whole environment is more individualistic, it will probably shift from the creativity and we start. Ha we probably start having the thought of we know what the customer want, versus if it's relational, it could be a lot better and probably more friendlier when it comes to serving marketing services or uh, advertising services to uh, clients. So when I employed more um, females, I started actually seeing more more value, um, actually solving problems through actually like better, uh, I could say like better communication skills. Um, and in the, um, I mean, in the beginning, it was something very challenging since I've never had, well, let's say like eight females reporting to me before. Uh, plus it's something new in the country. Not, I mean, not that new, but having uh, like fresh uh, females out of college, some of them have no work experience before, training them on how to do all this new thing um, to them was a bit of a challenge, but they were really um, fast learning and motivating, and especially women in Saudi Arabia now are really uh, motiva motivated to work, and they're more excited to find job more than males. Uh, it's actually harder to recruit males than uh, uh, recruiting um, females. So if you That's have any great. questions, Bonita, I'll be more than happy to answer. Uh, well, one of the things that, that uh, you had told me was that um, given that you're working on cre creating web presence, isn't that right? That's what your, your marketing work is for your clients? Yes. And, um, and you said that the women seem to have a real enthusiasm for expressing and um, uh, communicating <clears throat> what the client had to provide so that they're, you, you're very pleased with their, uh, their actual um, representation of the, of the customer. And, uh, yes, especially when it comes to copywriting, um, and especially when it comes to social media. Social media is all about touching the customer's emotions. Uh, we realize that when we have female copywriters, the messages that uh, the client wants, it comes out a lot better than um, a, male, uh, a male copywriter, especially if, if, if the category is more into fashion or food, other than the other B2B boring stuff. Yeah, 
Well, and then your customers are probably more more fashion. I mean, more more women as well. So um, yeah, makes sense. Well, um, I just wanted to uh, point out to the other the people that are also uh, part of this this session that one of the distinctions that we make in terms of competencies is both men and women have what we call uh, customer focus, but often the more more relational people have a focus of getting into the shoes of the customer, whereas often the more individualistic people are more, I know what's best for the customer, that's what Motaz was saying, um, and not as much empathy. And of course, all in all of this, we need both. The, I found the most effective uh, way of really producing innovation is to be able to have both. Um, but it's very important to be able to see the difference or else you get people frustrated and not understanding where people are coming from. So uh, also, thank you, uh, Part of our culture, um, we are a more of a high context uh, culture, not a low context. So having um, like the relational, um, let's say, features or the relational skills uh, helps more when it comes to a business like mine doing marketing services. Interesting. So now, you know, I would think that given your prevailing culture is also uh, more relational, then you also have men that are more relational as well. Um, but you still find yes. that the women have that, that edge. Yes, I mean, I one of the reasons is because uh, women are more motivated now to uh, to work and they want to prove themselves and to that they can establish their career and advance up up to leadership levels and management levels. I can understand that. Yeah, they're the new pool of talent that's there. That's great. Okay, let's. I want to hear some more about you know what it's like talking with. Uh, I know you've been talking with a big client. But let's get back and include um, Faison um, in uh, your experience, Faison. It's great to have you here. Oh, thank you. Uh, it's great to be here. Um, I actually, you know, listening to Daya and Noel, one of the one of the one of the key things that really um, was, you know, was very common in, in both of their uh, discussions was what we all learned from your class is that the Platten rule, right? Do, do you know give to well basically um, we, we cannot treat people the way that we want to treat them or you know we have to treat them the way they want to be treated and that was something I did not understand in my career um, you know coming out of college uh, at 22 I uh, started a company uh, making surveillance cameras for the military and we were a very male dominated team startup um, and, and going through that experience of only dealing with men, you know, you, you develop a very uh, uh, linear thinking uh, methodology in how you develop products and, and the way that you, you, you become very individualistic and you think everybody's like that. So when I, when I joined another startup, that's when I came across, I was appointed as a manager for an entire department. Uh, and being being young and inexperienced, I was 24. Um, I was given, you know, the, the the responsibility of managing people that included women who were much older than I was. And uh, a lot of times, because of the inexperience, um, I, I had a hard time understanding how men and women uh, function in terms of work, in terms of how they contributed towards <clears throat> development. I thought everybody, this is this is how it's done, this is how this is how you're supposed to do it. Now just do it. That that was kind of my my approach. And um, I think it was about the time when I took your class, um, it was it was coincidentally around around that time I was going through some issues with uh, one of one of my female direct reports. And what so happened was that it, it, during the class, there was a lot of things that were pointed out that made sense, that, that kind of resonated with me. And I felt, you know, maybe, you know, this, this, this makes sense. You know, what, what this class is talking about, what if I implement it in my work? What if I actually, you know, talk, talk to this 
to this, this person and actually employ the platinum rule. That was one thing. And try to understand where she's coming from, you know. And this was someone who you were about ready to. Oh yeah, I was. Go I was right? about to fire her. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so it was. I had reached that point in 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 in, uh, in my tolerance of of her at that, where I felt like she wasn't really contributing towards the company, but it was because I was looking at it from my lens. It was look in and it was look. I was looking at it through through you know how I would deal with that situation. And based on that, I failed her. I gave her an F on everything. And I said, and it was around that time when I took your class. And um, you know, Faison, I just want you, I just want you to know, I think I even remember the moment oh, yeah. that you the <laughs> lights went on. You, it was just amazing. The, the rest of this story is so incredible. Right. So I just want to go ahead. No, that that's true. And it was around, you know, I when I took this class, I actually, to be completely honest, I didn't really think I would from it as you know as I as I did and it turns out I I learned so much that I probably gave someone uh, a, a higher position in, in the company because of that uh, and uh, well tell the whole story you know yeah you, you went back and, and I went back and then I had a, I had a meeting with her and, I, and we talked about uh, we talked about what she was bothered to work what she why she couldn't perform why she was not able to uh, you know do the do the uh, uh, functionalities that she was asked to do and it turns out that there were certain things that she was doing that she did not like doing and she did not she was not good at and I was actually forcing her to do things that she was not good at and 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 what I did not understand that she was actually a mix of individual and relational and that what well, that was a that was a, that was a very unique combination in a person um, there were certain things she did where she was very relational. She included a lot of people, but there were certain things she did that she was very individualistic. So it, it, it's, it's very hard. It was very hard for me to, 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 to understand how to use this person. But then, you know, learning some techniques from, from class, I was able to become more tolerant where I basically, you know, started looking and observing what she did throughout a period of time, which is about three weeks, I think. <laughs> and I was using that as a, as material from my paper that I was uh, yeah. giving, that I was preparing for that class. And it was about that three week time period where she was allowed to work on different things. She was allowed to work on, she was basically manufacturing. So she was allowed to work in design and manufacturing and assembly and production. So she was allowed to work in different areas. And um, I basically was observing her throughout that time. And she didn't know that. She didn't know I was actually studying her. And I was trying to see how she, performed in each uh, uh, department or you know at each function and after three to four weeks um, even though it was a short period of time I actually figured out uh, what she was good at and uh, it was at a time when when I changed her job description altogether you know she basically uh, she was doing very hardcore manufacturing stuff uh, for engineering and uh, not to go into technical details but from what she performed and what she, what I observed that she was good at, the entire job description was changed. She was allotted a new position. Managing the line. Was yeah, it was basically managing the production managing line. Managing all the people on the production exactly. line. Okay. So she was, she was basically given a position to manage the entire assembly line and production line, and and she actually was, she did not expect it. She did not expect that this would be, I would come back with something like this after four weeks. Keep in mind that we, we had a meeting before the four weeks where I said, I need to get back to you about what I was going to do with you, <laughs> basically. And it was after those four weeks, she was surprised that I came to her with a new position. Which is a you know, the, a promotion, yes. right? Yes, yeah. a promotion, okay. where she did get a raise in her salary as well. Yeah. And, and, and her results from there, then on were pretty, pretty phenomenal. I mean, I, she did, she did, she's doing really well. And uh, we now have another, we just promoted another woman uh, within that same uh, area to manage uh, uh, some, some of the manufacturing of our products. Okay, now I'm going to toot your horn a little bit more <laughs> because the story goes that the, the CEO came in, that you oh, yeah. increased the productivity so much. Right, right. The CEO came in to see, to see what was going on. Yeah, and, and uh, 
yeah, that and the CEO came in and basically there was a huge change in you know they they you know how I was doing things. I mean, we didn't really do things this way. Where when I had already told him I was going to get rid of this person. Yeah. You keep in mind we're about a we're a startup, so we're like about 60 people. We're not we're not a lot of people. So when I made a decision on who what I wanted to do, I usually ended up doing it. And here I was actually delaying what I wanted to do. So um, then I actually told him and the management team about what I was trying to do. And and we actually have a, a woman on our board. She manages a, oh, I don't know. she works as a consultant in this company called W. I don't know, it's basically dealing with uh, clothing and helping women choose what to wear. Uh, I'm not too familiar with that area, so I'm, I, I can't, but she, she was so, she was very interested in this new, new thing where uh, here I was trying to help uh, a person of the opposite sex uh, in promoting her and making her do what she loves doing and she's good at doing. And that, that attitude uh, basically made my CEO come back and check out what I was doing. And we ended up, uh, you know, later on when, when he saw the results of that, he wanted me to present some of that information to, to the board. And, and I did that, and they were really, really excited how it, 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 I implemented what I learned on one person. And we started to, we started this new thing in our company where we want to employ more women now. <laughs> That's something. You know, and a lot of, a lot of, uh, we're trying to, we're trying to get more diversity because our, our area of technology is very uh, male dominated. You know, most of our products most of the stuff we do uh, is very, very um, hardcore engineering. There, there are some women in, in marketing and in, in, but we really want to expand that, that, that. And we have a huge thing coming up next month where we're actually completely revamping our entire engineering, and that's going to change our company. And that's where we, in a month or two, we're actually going to be launching this new process of recruitment. And that's going to include right. a lot of women in, in this process. Great. Yeah. Fabulous. So, so <laughs> that's yeah. basically what happened. Okay. Yeah. There are, it's basically, but some of the other points I just want to get on record. Right. Is that you brought, you decided to bring the in, the uh, engineering closer to the production oh, yes. floor. Oh, right. yes. That was right. all part of it. So right. there was right. more communication. There's more communication. And that was basically some of the things that were because of that uh, that female direct report being in that position where she used her skills to, to uh, um, you know, she was a relational person in that, in that aspect and she used her skills to bring production more to engineering, closer to engineering. So I should give her credit for that where she actually, she was good at doing that. I, I was not good at actually bringing those two departments together and because one of the, one of the things that I lacked as a manager was I was too individualistic in what I was doing. I was too focused on what I wanted to have, and uh, sometimes that's not the best thing for, for innovation, as we talked about. Well, it's and hindered a lot just of, a really lot of, fabulous, and I, right. I will also put it on record that you said that the um, it was the board and or the CEO. Right, the CEO you, did. They called you a visionary. Right. For the changes <laughs> yeah. that you brought in. Yeah, company. that. Be cool. That is because <laughs> a lot of times <laughs> when you when what a lot of times the what they expect from a lot of. Um, people uh, in my area of expertise, which is basically uh, firmware development and, and uh, programming processors, a lot, of, a lot of people in this area are very, um, because, of the, because of the field being very male dominated, they don't really, they're not really into trying to, you know, bring in more women or they're not into this area, they're not yeah. interested in, this, in this, this philosophy and ideology of, you know, let's get more diversity through women. Well, see, um, so that was a change. But you really showed that it made a difference. Yeah, it and did make a difference. And you distinguish those confidences. And I personally want more women to work now yeah. because it brings in more creativity. And as we're talking about in his, in his, in his uh, talk right now, uh, uh, there's an element of creativity and an element of cooperation and element of uh, 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 innovation that women bring in that's unprecedented. We, you know, and, and it's, it's, it's very important. It's, so it's great. very important. So it's that's exactly great. why we, we want to recruit more women because we want to diversify our product line. We want to go more into consumer products. So that's where we want to kind of get more uh, more ideas.
Fabulous. So. Fabulous. Okay, let's hear from Scott. <laughs> All right. Um, so it, it's interesting because I work for an incredibly large company, right? But the area I work in is uh, in operating systems, in particular, for three years I managed the kernel, which is, you know, basically just it's like the software side of what he does, right? Right. Okay. So it we couldn't get more individualistic or more low context than the environment I was in. Um, you know, uh, in fact, in the entire engineering part of the organization, 250 people, there was one female engineer. One. One female. Now, she was very high up in the ranks. And one day I was actually talking with her um, about a year ago. And I just, it was like we had a meeting we were both waiting for. And we just started talking and about what it was like to be a woman in this organization, which, you know, it's a great organization to work for, don't get me wrong, but just what was, what's it like? And she's like, well, you know, I learned very early on how to, how to be one of the guys. I was like, well, yeah, that's a complete crime, right? It's completely criminal that you had to learn that, she, you know? It's for her, it's like... What was her response to that? And she's like, well, I know, but you just, you just learn how to adapt. You learn how to, you know... I was like, yeah, but that's not what we want here, right? We want, we, we want to be able to bring... The, you know, the the ability to, the, the creativity and the the uh, uh, I don't remember exactly what, what I you know, but the um, flexibility and the thought processes that women bring to the party here because we'll get better at it she goes yeah I know women that are out there right now there aren't that many people out there right now uh, learning how to do this kind of low level software programming that we do right. But and there aren't that many women, uh, and so I've been responsible for college recruiting for our organization for three years now, and I actually made it a focus of mine to look for. And it's hard to tell because we're pretty blind in how we do our hiring because we're an international company. You have to be, but look for women coming out of these schools that we recruit from, and uh, actively interviewing them. And there and so in the first year out of twelve candidates, we hired two women. And the second year, I don't remember how many it was out of 25, but it was significantly higher. So the engineering organization is growing the percentage of women, you know, rapidly. Um, and one of those women I hired directly into my team as a kernel engineer. And um, I remember one of the guys, one of the new new grads came to me, and he was from the same school. They all, you know, they all knew each other. And, and he comes to me, and he, he wanted to talk to me, and he shut my door and said, well, you know, some of my friends said they're not coming to our team because she's here, because they don't deem her to be as good as everybody else. And my response to that was, I hired her for something very particular, which is she's got skills that none of you have. Wow. <laughs> okay. Wow. So she had a, her degree was in uh, machine learning, which is much more, you know, I mean, yeah, everyone here understands what, what that is, right? Her, but in machine learning, how to get computers to act and think more like people. It's like I have you know, a very unique need for someone to be able to, because we need to be able to build our system to be adaptable to any situation that is running in, being able to see things coming, predict, actually predict what's going to happen, and then, and then respond to it before it happens. And she's got that training, and none of you do. And none of you are going to have it. And so you, know, you can tell your friend, fine, I don't want them working for me. <laughs> you know, because I have a, I have I have corporate strategic decisions to make here, and she's part of that plan. And um, then we came up with another need where we needed to have we need to build a relationship with the with the other side of the organization. So there's um, you know Oracle has got many 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 different engineering teams spread out all over the world. And um, the database is obviously the largest of those, and the most most important. Let's be honest. And um, uh, you know, and my team comes from the from the Sun acquisition, being Solaris OS. Okay, and so we needed to build a relationship and actually put people on site with the database team. And the first person I put up was this woman, because I said we need to build relationships over there. I don't, and I, so I want her there. I don't want to put a bunch of guys that are going to sit in their cubes and not talk to anybody. <laughs> I gotta, they, how did your people respond to that? Did you say the management was on board with it? They're like, uh -huh. yeah, we get it completely. Okay. Right. And, how, and, and and it's been going very well. We now have five people working up there, and we've built this incredible relationship with the, with the team. In fact, we're now starting to work on the database code. So it's we have kernel engineers.
right? Which that wasn't going to happen. It wasn't going to happen. Wasn't going to happen. So those that's just some of the things that have been happening. Um, the other side that I got out of the class is I I learned I learned. Uh, this, to put it another way, what was wrong with me? Oh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. what was, what's wrong with them? What's wrong right. with me? Well, so what I, you know, what I learned is I'm very relational, right? And I've worked in a field that's incredibly individualistic. And, um, yeah, I've always wondered, like, what's wrong with me that I don't think more like other men? Like that. And I learned just I'm very relational. And um, I've been able to use that to my advantage, though. And so now I've grown up, you know, I've gone up through the ranks of my organization very quickly. I now in responsible for the entire strategy for my product instead of being a manager of engineers I actually manage the entire product management the, so I'm responsible for the global strategy for Solaris right and that was that was a job that I was asked to take on and my, my boss keeps saying the same thing you're the only other person in the org thank you the only <laughs> other person in the organization that, that can think bigger like this isn't that great so, so yeah so Fabulous. Yeah. Fabulous stuff. Yeah. Great. Well, you know, I, I want I want to hear more. I wanted to get to dive back to his other example, but yeah. um, I want to see if there are um, questions. Uh, Deanna, are you getting questions in the chat for us? I know there's a delay. I guess we're at, uh, yeah, there's one there on the window too. No, I, um, yeah. Okay. Uh, yes, it is usually done. That Montage is answering. Yeah. Um, I'm not. Let me shut down. Let's see if we can move this. Um, can I just move because I. Yes, uh, I could answer that. Is there a question? Go ahead. Yes, I received the question from Amani. I, I actually I answered back in the queue, but I could say the answer is not a problem. Amani has a question. And you answered it. Yeah. Okay. What was Amani's question? Yes. Uh, that if we could uh, introduce a topic of gender competence in uh, Saudi Arabia, either through um, workshops or school classes well my answer to this yes of course uh, it could be done to um we could target companies um fresh graduates so you could build a whole new generation of uh gender intelligence and also to students who are in their last semester uh senior senior college students in their last semester Well, that's well. Tell us a little bit about you're, you're talking to this large organization and what is it like uh, in yeah, Saudi Arabia? Been, uh, when uh, when I when I returned back two years ago, uh, I started um, reaching companies to do the uh, cross cultural training and the gender intelligence uh, course. Um, many of the companies they were kind of scared when they heard the gender issue. It was like um, it's like a topic they don't want to even get close to. <laughs> yeah. Until I got kind of successful with one of the companies, and then uh, I had a whole email thread of, I don't know, like 10 women fighting each other through email saying, we need this course. No, you don't need this course. It was your fault that you said this before. And I started seeing all work politics in a whole, <laughs> in a whole email thread. Then I assume that okay, I don't think uh, <laughs> I don't think this course is gonna work for this company. But now, thank God, I'm working on um, on a proposal. I'll probably get the brief uh, a, a better brief next week. But um, now we have uh, we have another door open at one of the most diverse organizations in the country. Um, it's gonna be one one hell of a challenge. I think they have over 40 nationalities working under one organization with males and, and females. So they want to solve both issues. They want to solve the cross-cultural issue. They want to, they want to solve the gender issue. Since they have people from, from different parts of the world where each single uh, nationality has its own um, thoughts and background on gender uh, competencies, whether males or females. 
So that's going to be one uh, big project. I'm probably going to need a lot of help, Bonita. So get ready. Okay, I'm ready. <laughs> I'm ready, and also Amani, we're getting Amani ready. I want to come, but if, if yes. uh, it's appropriate, yeah. So, um, yeah, it's very, very exciting. I mean, it, certainly um, having all the international students that have been here and seeing the value that um, understanding gender confidence has brought. I just want to uh, get Elisa Udaya to to you guys to to say something about the team that you were working with and the differences made with what you see as possible with global teams now, which is outside it's a little bit outside the gender scope, but it still contributed to that. So I want to uh, um, give a little bit of background before I uh, sure. uh, start uh, talking about this. Um, I was leading uh, a team of uh, 10 people uh, who are uh, geographically distributed, a uh, team in uh, Santa Clara, team in uh, RTP, and a team in Beijing. So we had the team uh, in Santa Clara and Beijing, but uh, um, the Beijing team was something new to us. We had to set up the team. Uh, we had to deliver something uh, uh, something for the, for the upcoming release. Um, so let's pause here for a, for a minute and uh, come back to uh, what I'm doing at school, uh, and then we can see how these two things are correlated. Uh, I'm I'm working on my part-time masters, and I am I'm doing a computer science my masters in computer science, and I'm only interested on um, on computer science. I know there are like the clue the school uh, asks you to take some courses which are related to engineering and engineering management. One of them is uh, uh, one of them is uh, gender engineering and the other one is uh, uh, working with globally distributed teams. I pushed them so uh, until the end actually because I wanted to do more on the on the uh, computer science and related things. Let's come back to what I'm uh, what I'm working. Uh, so I had to I had to work in a team and we had to set up a new team and we uh, uh, we have our sister teams uh, in Be uh, Beijing, and they helped us. The managers out there helped us to um, bring up a new team. Oh, it's all good, great. Now we have team here, team in uh, Beijing, and team in RTP. But the problem is when we started to engage the engage the Beijing team into the project. So um, there is a way. Uh, th there is a lot. There is a lot of difference between the way. Uh, teams here operated and the teams in Beijing operated. I'll just give a couple of examples and a uh, couple of examples. So uh, one one thing is uh, somebody uh, one um, my counterpart in Beijing visited here and he was here for a couple of weeks and uh, uh, for training session for uh, initial ramp ups. Um, it was great. I provided him. I was uh, I, I provided him whatever documents are required. How to how to set up. Set up the project, build, and what kind of things that we are working on the uh, working on the upcoming release. It's all good. I appointed him all the documents, and then okay, these are the things that you need. And if you have any questions, get back to me, and we are done. And he went back. Uh, he was here for two weeks. Um, we had like um, kind of daily uh, uh, interactions, uh, but most of them are informal. He went back, and um, uh, after two weeks. His manager talked to my manager uh, that the training was not useful. I was surprised. Why? I, I asked why. I provided all the information that is required and why do you think it is useful? And if it wasn't useful, why didn't he tell, tell it to me on my face? And why it, it has to go through this, uh, this it, it has to come through this way. Uh, I was upset. I, I was a mm -hmm. little bit upset. Because, okay, this is my first interaction. I tried to provide as much as information as possible and um, uh, and it didn't go well, but um, there is something on um, uh, now. If I look back, there is something on my wrong on my end too. I didn't think what I didn't look for what he's expecting, and I didn't realize that there is a way that I see things and the way he sees things, and I didn't think that I I, I really uh, did not think um, about the power distance. Uh, so, which is a term that comes from cross-cultural understanding that the, the relationship of his with his 
relationship with you and also with his boss. Yes. Right. Okay. So from his perspective, um, I have to um, I have to uh, uh, explain things, and I was I was hoping that he would come back to me with the question, but he was I was from his perspective. He was expecting that I would uh, handhold him and take to take to the next next step, uh, which is uh, which I was not aware of, and also the uh, considering the cultural background, uh, and he has to he he has to go to his manager to convey anything to me. So that that's what happened, and uh, in two weeks actually, um, he he was expecting that I would be more proactive and help him, but. I was expecting that okay, I provided him all the documents or all the things that is required for him to be successful, and he would come back to me if he has questions. So that was that was the gap, and uh, there were a few more uh, instances. And finally, I decided okay, I'm not. It's enough. Uh, I don't want to lead a team. I wanted to be an individual contributor, and I become an individual contributor. After that, I took this this class, and uh, I decided okay, there is something uh, something missing here. Either I should learn. Uh, uh, and uh, and understand how people think. And I started to I, I I said maybe I should take some classes. Then that's when I realized okay, there are some classes in the school that I'm supposed to take. And <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I took those classes. I took the um, working with global engineering teams. And then the next thing is oh maybe I should look at what is this gender and engineering. Okay now I know the differences between cross cultural teams. And why should I why shouldn't I look more? Into how men and women think, and that's how I ended up with this class, and um, it's been great. Well, the, and the the thing that I saw out of it, Udaya, was that um, you said that after you resigned from the team, then your boss even decided that there wouldn't be an international team that only Beijing would do things in Beijing, and you would do things here, and then your other place, I think, uh, yeah. here in the United States, and so it broke up having the opportunity to have a global team. But now he is ready. Now he says, now I can lead a team like that. Yes, I can. What a difference. You know, and even though it was it was cross cultural, there were things that in that he learned in my in the class about gender, about differences that uh, and different competencies that uh, allowed him to, to recognize that yes you can take on teams like that again. So I wanted to get that part in because uh, I think that's a big loss for people to make the decision that we can't have global teams, and you were able to turn that around. I mean, I think that example itself is like I was uh, I was so focused. I wanted I'm an engineer. I wanted to focus on only things that are interesting to me, computer science only, but not really into engineering or engineering management related things. And uh, this class uh, has helped me to. Be what I am today. That's really wonderful. Really wonderful. I know we have to wrap up. We could go on all day, as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> but um, uh, I just wanted to take an opportunity to let people know you can turn to the last, um, the last number ten PowerPoint, uh, just for contact information and resources. I, I will just say that the gender engineering class came out of the workshops I was doing for corporations, and I, it's actually done as a, a workshop format in uh, the university. It's two full sat Saturdays and a half Saturday. Um, but it can be done as a workshop inside of organizations, and that's what Motaz is planning to do, mm -hmm. and uh, several of, other of us. Um, I'm starting to train people to be able to do this. Um, and one of, the, one of my favorite topics, instead of calling it gender and engineering, is Innovation. What's gender got to do with it? Mm -hmm. But we can we can talk. Uh, you know, we can have all different kinds of topics. Pardon me. There's a comment there. Oh, a comment. Okay. Amani says awareness is the key to create to create the desired harmony between males and females in every aspect of life. Actually, if we had more time, I'd also ask about uh, what happens in their personal lives, but we don't have enough time. <laughs> so um, one of the other things I do specialize also in, in just working with women, doing a course called Calling Out the Brilliance of Women. So on that note, um, what I want to add is I now, whenever I say that I work with Calling Out the Brilliance of Women, I have to add, and the greatness of men. Thank you very much. You're all so fabulous. Thank you.
thank you for being with us today. Thank you, Motan. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for having me. Thanks great. to everybody for a really great panel. And um, I know everyone who watched it uh, has plenty of takeaways to uh, help them create an environment where um, there's more understanding and more empathy and, and more working together uh, in an environment where everyone can succeed. And I love the idea of the platinum rule. Uh, I think that's great. That's one of my big takeaways. So thank you for that. So this concludes this session. Uh, I want to thank everyone for participating. Um, and I want to invite you to our next session, which is Women in ICT, the Global Failure of Intervention Programs. It's just bad business. So it's with Sonia Bernhardt, who's an expert in this space. She's the CEO of Thoughtware, and she has been working in this area for a number of years and has been a very frequent panelist and keynote speaker at a number of events that I've hosted over the years. So I hope that you will take this time and visit her as well. So thank you so much, everybody. Thanks, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Thanks. that's it. We're going to end now. Thanks, everyone. See you soon. Look hard.